Hey everyone, this is uh, Howard Mann standing in for Jeff Caney this week. Welcome to the webinar. I'm going to start with Brian this week, so you should see the invitation, Brian. Got it. Okay, great. You guys should all see a chess radiograph on a neonate. Very good. Um, so this is a, a, a several day old child. I think she was uh, maybe uh, two days old at the time of this chest radiograph um, with prenatally diagnosed abnormality of the great vessels, um, which at first was thought to be a transposition of the great arteries. Um, and as we'll see in a moment, um, uh, proved to be slightly more complex. Um, so what we see on the radiograph, uh, a relatively large cardiothymic silhouette, um, and what looks like a right-sided bronchial branching pattern on the right with the right upper lobe bronchus um, arising uh, proximal to the uh, bronchus intermedius supplying the right middle and right lower lobes. And then on the left, uh, uh, what looks like a conventional left-sided bronchial branching pattern where the left upper lobe arises um, uh, very close proximity to the uh, left lower lobe bronchus. Um, so uh, she, the echo wasn't convincing, so they, she, they proceeded to uh, a cardiac MRI. I apologize for the, the, gran the granularity. This is uh, at day six of life. Um, uh, so very good images uh, for considering how small she was. Um, and what we see on this, if we go up to the neck, um, we see a trachea here at the level of the thoracic inlet. And what looks like a conventional um, uh, aortic arch branching pattern with a, a brachycephalic artery, a left common carotid, and a left subclavian artery. As we come down, we see that they form a, an aortic arch. Um, and uh, as we come down a little bit more, we see there's a, a, a short segment, a mild narrowing, um, uh, right at the distal aortic arch or aortic isthmus, and then a relatively large patent ductus arteriosus, um, which, can, uh, which is this structure here, which connects to the main pulmonary artery. Uh, the main pulmonary artery also supplies the LPA, uh, the left pulmonary artery. But what you uh, what is noticeably absent is that there's no right pulmonary artery arising from this structure. Um, instead, if we go back up and follow the aortic arch again, we see right after the right brachycephalic artery, there's this vessel right here, and I'll show that on a coronal also, that arises uh, actually slightly proximal um, or inferior to the brachycephalic artery and then comes down and supplies the entire right lung. Um, as we come down inferiorly, we see a relatively normal uh, cardiac anatomy with a, 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 le a left ventricle and right ventricle, right atrium, left atrium, um, uh, a right-sided liver, a left-sided stomach and spleen. Um, and let me show you uh, the coronal as well. So again, here's the uh, systemic left ventricle giving rise to the aorta. Here's that first vessel coming off of it and coming down here and supplying the entire right lung. And then the right brachycephalic artery, the left common carotid, and the left subclavian artery. That short segment narrowing, a little coarctation there, uh, the left ductus arteriosus, um, and then the descending thoracic aorta. So um, this entity, uh, at first we, we kind of mis uh, misinterpreted this as a uh, uh, perhaps a, a large uh, major aortal pulmonary collateral artery arising from the aorta and supplying the right lung. However, uh, you can see that cork right there. However, um, this is an entity that's very well known to the pediatric interventional cardiology and, and congenital cardiac uh, uh, world, um, where it's bilateral ductus arteriosi or ducti arteri ar arteriosi. And in discussions with them, um, they reference this paper, um, which um, uh, is an excellent illustration of, of the, the genetics uh, or the, the fetal embryology of that. Um, and it was written by, by one of our, our cardiac uh, cardiologists. Um, and uh, what you can see here uh, in this entity, they're bilateral ductus arteriosi and, uh, and the segment that connects the MPA to the RPA um, it can become a tretic or, or gone. And uh, then the only thing uh, supplying the RPA is that, is that residual ductus arteriosa uh, ductus arteriosus on the right um, and so it's very important in these kids that they remain on prostaglandins um, and uh, furthermore interestingly so we've we've seen on the, in this conference uh, uh, a few different cases of, of the so-called proximal interruption of the pulmonary artery um, which uh, in discussions with the, uh, the the this group of cardiologists they said that's a misnomer and that's something that uh, is probably this entity where there's a right-sided ductus arteriosus that's missed 
um, uh, and becomes uh, occluded or stenotic uh, shortly after birth. Um, so uh, uh, just an uh, interesting case of a bilateral ductus arteriosi um, that uh, if left untreated would become something that, uh, that looks like a proximal interruption of the pulmonary artery. Hmm. And I'd, I'd never heard of this before, um, but they were all very, very confident that that, that PIPA, uh, proximal eruption of the pulmonary artery, doesn't exist and that it's this entity, um, which uh, makes sense with the fact that the this portion of the, the kind of the mid to distal portions of the right in, uh, pulmonary arterial tree are relatively normal, even in PIPA, um, and that the, the pulmonary veins and uh, lung are well-formed. Um, and of course, as we know, they, they often go on to develop uh, progressive fibrosis. Mm, yes, I don't know about that. Yeah, I'll send, I'll send this case and the, the, the paper out later. Yeah. Great. That, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Give me a moment to try to get my controls back up here. Okay, let me change over to Peter. Peter, you should see the invitation coming your way. Good. Um, can you guys see the screen? Yeah, now we can also hear. Okay. Go ahead, good. Oh, great, okay. Okay, let me see which case this was. Um, good, let's see here. Start with this is just kind of a straightforward but a nice example case. Uh, this is a patient with uh, RCC, and um, we didn't image low enough to see the mass, but you can see kind of the classic uh, RCC uh, tumor thrombus that's going into the uh, into the into the renal vein and then into the uh, IVC, and then if, if you look at the lungs, this is a is extensive uh, metastatic disease, but this is a really good example of uh, the beaded vessels with um, intravascular uh, METs. And uh, you can see how hypervascular the METs are, uh, as you would expect with um, renal cell. And uh, some of them, some of them you can see even the low density there. That's probably just uh, thrombus ad admixed with the uh, metastatic renal cells. But here, just a ni nice example of beaded vessels, uh, renal cell meds, pretty advanced. Um, this one is a nice. Chest radiograph case uh, shown shown to me by my uh, colleague Stefan Tigges. Um, so I think the indication here is line placement, and here we have a left uh, left pick which looks okay, and here's another central line uh, that was recently placed, and this one looks a little strange. Um, you can see this one is coming into the SVC here. This one seems like it's going medial. The SVC is is right there. There's not a whole lot of rotation here, uh, also. And um, the other thing is it's going a little high, right? So it's above the uh, above the clavicle, whereas this one is below the clavicle, as you as you would expect the subclavian course. So here's the CT of the chest. It was done shortly after to show where that line goes. So I went into the plural space on the right. Mm. Just a good good example of a uh, bad line placement. 
Yeah. You say that Peter was the was the plural fluid from catheter installation or was no. that pre-existing? I'm not I'm not I, that's a good question. I'm not sure actually. I am not sure about that. I, I actually thought about the same thing uh recently, uh, when I was pulling this case up earlier today. I'm not sure I didn't look that up. But yeah, it's a unilateral effusion, so yeah, so you you'd be concerned about it. And does the, um, the patient have severe pulmonary arterial hypertension of some etiology, perhaps, or lung? This patient, I'm trying to remember. Okay. Uh, this patient, oh, this patient, yes. I actually showed, <laughs> I actually showed a few weeks ago, if you guys remember, I was showing a bunch of uh, lupus cases. And oh, we, okay. I showed uh, the anterior uh, lung destruction pattern uh, okay. in lupus. This, this is, this was actually one of the patients I was showing last week, but they didn't have the, the line placed at that point. Okay, so that so that yeah, so this patient has uh, severe lupus, and then they have really bad um, pulmonary hypertension, and they have the um, lung destruction. So last week I was showing this case. It wasn't this exact scan before the line placement, but this patient has lupus. That's probably why he has the, the or she has the um, pleural effusion. Potentially, yeah. Okay. But I'm not completely sure about the, whether it's related to the line also. Yeah, so this is uh, lung destruction from lupus and um, really bad advanced pulmonary hypertension. Uh, this one is one of these cases that is not clinically significant, but I thought it was interesting because I learned something new. Um, so I was reading, um, you should start off with this one. I was reading a case with one of our excellent first year residents, and he asked me if the uh there's some he's wondering if the, there's calcification as he gives vein I, I said it's probably just contrast but then he did some uh uh researching and he uh looked up that that's these this is actually contrast here that gets uh retained commonly because of uh azagus valves uh, that are here so if the patient gets uh, a high rate of contrast injection uh, uh, the contrast will reflux into the azagus vein, and then some of it will just get retained here um, behind the valves of the azagus vein, which um, which I wasn't aware of. But then I that was a few weeks ago, and then I've been seeing this this abnormality uh, more um, on more scans. I just thought it was interesting. Here here's another example of the same thing. You have this, these little foci right there where the valve is, the azagus valves are. And then it uh, turns out this was published in uh, radiology uh, back in 2004. Okay. Um, yeah, so the azagus arch valves, and then they, they point out these small foci. Did you guys notice that? This is new to me. Yeah, I think so. Sometimes we might go by that, but I, I think I have seen. But I never really paid attention to it. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's it's interesting. It's it's no more noticeable, I think, when it's when it's the valve is not patent anymore, um, and and when there's reflux into the azica system, which you can see, like in an SVC obstruction. Yeah. So okay, and then. Um, and then this was this is a LV mass case. Um, so I'll start off with the CT. There's a large mass here in the um, inferior wall of the LV. Um, low density, low attenuation. Um, no, not much uh, enhancement here, as far as you can tell on this scan. Uh, patient is 18, by the way, and I think she was she had some uh, PVCs she was presenting with, but otherwise. Um, asymptomatic and uh, so yeah so then I'll show the MRI I'll show just two sequences this is a uh, post contrast T1 uh, early post contrast and you can see the, the mass here um, not much in the way of maybe some early heterogeneous enhancement some of this is just artifact here um, and then here's the um, Delayed enhancement, you can see well circumscribed with um, very homogeneous enhancement. 
So, um, and then here are the intra-op uh, images. So this is an interesting image. This is the uh, intra-op, the, the, so this is the inferior wall and the heart is actually pulled out of the thorax through the sternotomy to, to, to show the inferior wall. So it's kind of a inferior, the inferior reflection here. And uh, here is the incision. You can see the, the mass right in the myocardium. Here's the mass excised right there. And here's the patch repair of the inferior wall. And so, yeah, so again, we have a well circumscribed mass, um, which is which is low attenuation on T1 and T2 pre-contrast and then avidly enhancing on the delay. So the imaging is consistent with the fibroma and that's what we predicted and that's what it, it ended up uh, being, so the LV fibroma. And here's the um, path, uh, here's the interface between the mass, which is on the right side, right side and you can see the, um, you can see the, uh, the mass here with a, a lot of uh, collagen infiltrating uh, with very few cells. And then here on the left is the um, myocardium with uh, more, more cellular myocardium, essentially pretty, pretty well margin, pretty good margin here, clean margin. And uh, here is a higher power and you can see the, the basically the, the collagen with some, some, some my, my, uh, my, myocytes here, but essentially a lot of collagen fibroblasts. So I showed I showed one uh, LV fiber. This is the second LV fibroma we've seen in the last uh, two or three months, which has been interesting, both in young patients. Um, interesting. I think that, that's all I have. Great, that's interesting. Thank you. Yep. Yes. All right, I'm going to switch over to David. Good. So can people see a non-chest radiograph? Good. My excuse is that this, is, this limb is attached to the chest, so it's legit. But this person does have a soft tissue mass down here, a young guy at this point and this was resected, and it was a malignant uh, peripheral nerve sheath tumor. So he does have some chest imaging. And this is his, what his chest radiograph looks like. He's got some scoliosis here, and he's got these very strange attenuated ribs up here, plus a hint of a uh, mediastinal mass here, maybe a little deviation of the uh, trachea and here's what his cross-sectional imaging looks like there's quite a bit of expansion here of the spinal canal and these um, foramina here with this low attenuation stuff so very strange looking set of chest imaging and if we do um, some imaging here with magnets uh, we can see that this is basically um, low attenuation fluid here involving, this is not, not a spinal mass, but this is actually dural ectasia. So the whole setting here is neurofibromatosis. The rib deformities are what caught my, my eye first, and these are so-called ribbon ribs. So I've not seen very many examples of ribbon ribs, but this rib deformity is one of the features of neurofibromatosis. I didn't see any skin lesions on our cross-sectional imaging, but he does have very nice rib and ribs and dural ectasia. Um, he does have this unusual kind of scoliosis, but almost everybody with neurofibromatosis has scoliosis, but it's, it's supposed to be an upper and uh, sharply angulated scoliosis, but it's often a very ordinary scoliosis. This one's a little bit, um, less ordinary scoliosis. So this is neurofibromatosis with ribbon ribs, part of the mesenchymal dysplasia that goes with this condition. Okay. Great. So I pulled out this old case, you know, from my database of previous examples of ribbon ribs. I've only got 
this one other. There was an earlier case that doesn't have any images and packs, just on film, long discarded. This person has very nice rib deformities too. In this case, um, I I don't. The MR studies are not available. So, but by description, there was a lot of neurofibroma. So, so this is actually neural tumor in this person. This is not dural ectasia, and there were neurofibromas or other nerve sheath tumors along the ribs, and that, that's what was causing the rib deformities here, rather than, you know, perhaps it was just pressure from the adjacent neurofibromas that's remodeling the ribs here. You can see the ribs are abnormally spaced, um, and there is, again, scoliosis in this person. So another example of neurofibromatosis with um, rib and ribs, in this case, maybe neurofibromas remodeling the ribs. Mm. Yeah. And um, here's a, um, a person who had Hodgkin lymphoma diagnosed at this point. This is back, I think, 2008, and we'd have this mediastinal mass. There's also uh, lymphadenopathy in the neck. Uh, the person was treated with radiation therapy um, back in 2008, and then the person came back, and here is current imaging on this person. Let me show you. Um, a scalp view to show you that there is a tumor now in this left apex. On cross-sectional imaging, it's slightly inhomogeneous, very firm looking tumor, and it lights up on PET. So here with this uptake. And this lesion was resected, and this is a malignant uh, nerve sheath tumor. So originally on biopsy, it was thought to be a schwannoma, but when they got more tissue, they could see that there were signs of atypia that tilted them toward uh, malignancy. And in the setting of previous radiation, they're attributing this tumor, this sarcoma, to the previous radiation. So this is a radiation-related malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor. So it has a little resonance with that first case where there was a similar nerve sheath tumor, malignant nerve sheath tumor, as a presenting thing in that man with neurofibromatosis. In this case, it's radiation-related malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor. So mm -hmm. the time course is fine. Typically, radiation-induced tumors show up around seven years after radiation. In this, this man, is a little bit longer than that but it's still very plausible. This was definitely part of the radiation field for his childhood uh, Hodgkin lymphoma. Okay, guys. So the radiation-induced sarcomas, David, isn't it uh, usually decades later as a general rule? Longer than the typical, you know, when, when I read about radiation-induced tumors, they talked about seven years being- Oh, really? But maybe sarcomas take longer. Mm. I don't. Uh, I, I I don't differentiate by cell type, but perhaps yeah. there's a literature for that. And they they thought this one could be arising from a nerve as opposed to just a well, just a sarcoma, I suppose. Origin uncertain, but they thought this one was. They, well, they think they this one is arising from a nerve. From they don't, I don't think they said what it originated in, but okay. it originated from a, from a nerve sheath up right. there that was in the radiation field. So probably an intercostal nerve. Oh, okay. They thought it was a nerve sheath, malignant. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Good. Thank you. Okay. Good. The first one I'll show is just interesting anatomy. That's not what I wanted to do. Load all of them up at the same time. Let me go to this one. So in reading this one, I noticed initially 
an anatomic variation that we see not uncommonly. Let me get to the right place, which is a vertebral artery that arises from the aortic arch. But that's quite common. And then I saw another vessel here and I said, oh, you know, what's that? So let's look at that one. And I'll mag up here and tell me if you agree that this one here sure seems to arise from the subclavian artery right here. And then I followed that down. There it goes, paratracheal. It starts drifting towards the midline, sort of, then comes midline, ducks under the carina, and it makes its way towards the right lung, the right hilar region. So unless I'm misinterpreting this, this appears to be a bronchial artery, but arising from the origin close to of the left subclavian. So do you guys agree that are looking at this and have you seen that before? No. Does, does this patient have a reason to have, um, they have lung disease or do they have a reason to have more prominent bronchial arteries? No, no, no real lung disease, no. Yeah, I, I guess that, that one's not too big. Yeah, it's not particularly large, but sure looks like that, doesn't it? Yeah, I've never seen that. And then I kept going and I thought, oh, wait a minute, there's yet something else when I got down here. I said, oh, that's something else too. So let me show you that. Here is its entry into the, or its communication with the left atrium. So here is a wide mouth communication of it. And there it goes to there. And of course, we have a superior pulmonary vein, fine, inferior pulmonary vein, fine. So that is a unusual, by location, left atrial diverticulum. And then I showed one of these a couple of weeks ago, but it, that one came up from the usual place, which is the anterior superior left atrium. This one comes off, there it is, that's odd. So I think it is, unless someone else recognizes an anatomic item that I'm not familiar with, a funny left atrial diverticulum in an odd place. Clearly just an incidental finding. Anyone seen a diverticulum in that location? That's odd. No. Yeah. I've never seen that before. Yeah. So in the sort of category of left atrial outpouchings, one can get accessory atrial appendages, but like a conventional atrial appendage, those typically have the appearance of a left atrial appendage, the cauliflower look, the little pectinate muscle type structures within it, whereas a diverticulum, so-called diverticulum, another outpouching, has smooth interior margins. And of course, this one doesn't contain any thrombus or anything. So two curiosities, isn't it? One person. OK. Here I want to focus on just identifying devices. And I'll show you some interesting things. So if you're reading bedside radiographs, and you're describing the location of different structures. Well, here is a left ventricular impeller device at some point in time. That's fine. Here is another time when we have the left ventricular impeller device. Now we have an atrial cannula. So one should be thinking of um, ECMO, some kind of external support. And then What's different from the previous is this. So I'll show you that in a moment. But now we have this lung that's not aerated anymore. 
and there's diffuse opacity here. So now I'll just mag in to first deal with this. This is a bronchial blocker. So we have, and I'll bring up the picture alongside. And you can see that that portion in left main bronchus, the balloon is inflated. So they are occluding that left bronchus intentionally. And we have diminished aeration of the left lungs. So that makes sense. I couldn't quite figure out exactly what was happening here that led them to decide to do a unilateral lung ventilation and to intentionally blow up the balloon in the left main bronchus. But the appearance of that is this so-called easy blocker device. And of course, we're seeing these rather slim limbs of the bronchial blocker and the balloon inflated. So that was interesting. And then I looked at the CT. Here is the balloon inflated of the blocker, Eris lung. And then I said, oh, wait a minute. That's not good. So here we have thrombi that are forming in the aorta in contiguity with the left ventricular impeller device. So it got me wondering how often one <clears throat> that occurs, and we simply don't see it because we don't do CT imaging of left ventricular impeller devices. But certainly one would causally associate that, I would think, with the presence of the left ventricular impeller device. Look further down to look for emboli coming off that to the kidneys or the spleen. Don't see that. Have any of you incidentally come across a situation where you have thrombi forming in the aorta about components of the LV impeller device like this? I think this is the second, maybe third time I've seen that. I don't think I've seen one, but we don't, like you said, we don't see them super often, you know, with yeah. the, the, seems like there's an uh, inferior wall MI there on the, oh, uh, that's probably why they, yeah, that's why that, so, or um, if you go inferiorly. Let me just go down here and see, we get that. Uh... Yeah, right there, with oh, okay. the BSD. Okay. Yeah, with the, with the BSD. That's probably why they have the, uh, I didn't get the case. Oh goodness, I didn't even get that far in this case. I've had this in my in my database for some time and didn't get all that information. So obviously a very complicated. Okay, got it. So you think it's causing a VSD? The the infarct is rotted out. Mm -hmm. I I I assume I assumed that it was the they have a they have a, had an infarct with really low EF and that's why they have the impella device in there and then the, the yeah you think, yeah you think it's the VSD from the infarct yeah the VSD is a sequela of the infarct and then basically yeah, it's also, so, I'm all right, thank you. right I have to go back and get the whole the whole spiel in the case which I don't have there's pericardial fluid and there's other things going on. Lots of other things. Okay. Oh, there's a pericardial. Is there a pericardial drain? Oh, there's a pericardial drain too. So obviously a very complex sick patient. They've drained some pericardial fluid. That's a pericardial drainage tube as well. Okay. Okay. I put this as a follow-up case, but I didn't get around last night to looking at the whole case and getting the whole story. Sorry about that. Okay. Yeah. Here's an interesting patient. So I saw this after this was obtained, but here is the context. So this has some interesting findings by itself. So here we have a patient this is imaging prior to the intervention I'll show you in a moment. So we see abnormal descending aorta, and we see calcifications, um, intimal calcifications, but also rather strange calcifications too, but the aorta is clearly dilated. 
and this CT will show you the pathology. So we see we have two lumens, two lumen, we have false lumen, we see that we have calcifications that are actually related to the false lumen. So this is of long standing. So here is calcifications related to that. We have some contrast medium, but we have a lot of thrombus as well. So true lumen, chronic, abnormal, false lumen, but there is some perfusion of the false lumen. So in that kind of context, one would think perhaps this patient has one of the complications that follow a type B dissection that is progressive dilatation of the false lumen that in that literature is called negative remodeling and progressive negative remodeling related to the false lumen. So not surprising, the intervention that followed was this, they stented that. So this is imaging from the placement of a stent, and this is the morning of. In the evening, when the patient was admitted to the intensive care unit, the patient experienced an episode of severe chest pain And you'll see here that we have the stent that I showed you, but now we have a communicating dissection with an intermomedial flap. The flap arises in relation to the proximal landing zone edge of the stent and involves the ascending aorta. So that occurred very soon after placement of the stent. So there is the entity that goes by the acronym of SIGN, S-I-N-E, which stands for Stent Graft Induced New Entry Tear. Stent Graft Induced New Entry Tear. I'm usually with the SIGN lesion. The new entry tear could be related to the distal part of the stent or the proximal part of a stent. And the typical sign occurs months or even years later and usually arises in relation to the distal portion of the stent. There are all kinds of theories as to why that might happen. One theory has to do with oversizing of the stent, predisposing or being a risk factor for the later development of a new entry tear. The clinical context here, though, is quite different. This is an acute event, and it clearly involves the proximal part of the stent and needs to have surgery, which was done. So here you can see a description of the surgical procedure to correct this and address this. You can see that they actually were able to see some of the stents in relation to the adventitia of the aorta at surgery so we can look at the, the stent and how they maybe seem to some of them poke out a little bit perhaps in relation to the aorta but no surprise that they actually saw some of this actually visible in the adventitia so they had to repair that as you can see here um, here is you, you can find lots of articles here's one i just arbitrarily put there Stent graft induced new entry tear after endovascular repair for Stanford type B. This is from 2010. You can find lots of articles in the surgical literature about sign and the discussion about it. But this is this is a rather unusual acute event that happened in this patient. Anyone encountered that before? Peter, maybe at your place you do a fair amount of surgery like this. Yeah, I mean, I've seen the, I'm trying to remember if I've seen uh, one post, uh, I've seen retrograde dissections, uh, but I'm trying, I can't remember specifically if it was after, after the stent, but immediately, like if it was a sign case. So I'm not sure, but I'll be on the lookout in the future. Yeah. It's a nice, nice case. 
yeah pretty dramatic oh, yeah that's interesting can you can you show the root um is they're talking about a aortic yeah, regurgitation this goes all the way down to the uh, root pretty close to, down into the root down here yeah this i was going into the right uh coronary sinus which yeah it seems like right there yeah it's yeah all the way down yes yes yeah yeah Oh, it's, interesting, it's interesting that there's severe AI, um, so maybe the valve is also um, was, was involved. It's kind of interesting. Or maybe because the root was too dilated. Perhaps, yeah. Yeah, it's a good case. Yeah, kind of scary, yeah. All right, here is my last case for today. So. Let's say you're looking at a radiograph this, like this. I'll put up the lateral. And the patient is not being imaged because of an acute illness of any kind. You know, how might one describe this hemithorax down here? It's hard, other than saying there's opacity down here. It's hard to know the origin and the nature of it. Is it pleural space abnormality? Is it pleural thickening? It seems to be a lot more opacity than one would get with pleural thickening, but it could be a lot of that. Um, if there were lots of surgical staples here in the upper abdomen, might might begin to think about other things. So take a look and notice that there are multiple healed fractures. There's a fracture on the other side. So I was kind of hinting on these fractures here too, about whether if there were lots of uh, staples up there, one might think of thoracic splenosis with a post-traumatic thoracic splenosis. That would be quite reasonable. So let's have a look at the imaging now, and I will show you the coronal, which is here. So I'll put that up here, make it big. So we go here, and first we notice the spleen is there. It appears fine. Scrolling around, looking at that. Oh, now we appreciate that what's in the basal hemithorax is actually fat, not pleural disease. And sure enough, here is a defect. So we see that, and we see fat coming up into the chest, but the colon, the spleen are all in the right place. So it turned out this person had a MRI, and I couldn't figure out exactly why, but took the opportunity to look at it. Now this is from 2002, that's from 2021, so that goes way back. But what's nice about this is one can easily see that exactly the same findings are present in 2002. So we have findings that I consider quite consistent with an maybe unrecognized, unrepaired traumatic rupture of left hemidiaphragm. And he's lucky, just a bit of fat went up into there, and even to now, no complication has occurred. And we see that. I think I've seen a couple of these in my career that we've attributed to unrecognized or unrepaired traumatic rupture of left hemidiaphragm in this case. David, I'm sure you've probably seen some that were never repaired and patients did okay. That's right. So, um, you know, it's really variable. People, they, they say that it should always be the, considered to be an acute problem and it sh there should be intervention even if it's years out because they can strangulate later on. But I don't think I've seen any examples of that. Um, so, you know, I think the people that rupture their hemidiaphragm and don't have a problem are not going to present with imaging. So we're not seeing yep. right. the denominator. Yep. Exactly. I think I have maybe two or threes in my teaching file like this that I've attributed to that. This makes really great sense when you have so many rib fractures and other things that one would attribute it to prior trauma. Great. Well, those are mine. I think um, anyone else um, 
on newly that want to showcases? I don't think so. Let's see. If not, thanks everyone. Thanks guys. Thanks Howard. Thank you. Thank you Howard. Thank you. See you next week. Okay. Bye everyone. Thank you. Bye bye.